excited to get to host this panel of a show that I am a very deep, huge fan of. Uh, I'm uh, Pat Oswald from Basic Cable. Thank you so much. Um, yes, come to the happy panel tomorrow. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna piggyback my own show on yours, Neil. I'll take it. How's that feel? It's called show business. All right. Um, I want to bring our, uh, our, our esteemed panel up uh, to talk about season two. So let us begin introducing each of them. We're going to fill all these chairs. And one of these, yes, one of these chairs has the magic briefcase. So let's find out <laughs> which one. Uh, first, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Damare Barnes. And she said, well, they do when I said, 
no. And then we did worse. We left her off the list. <laughs> it's because of being dead. Ricky, what are you doing? I'm working for stars right now. <laughs> this is Obviously, start by talking to Neil about um, this is a weird, this is a weird panel to host because there's a lot of stuff that obviously we want to know and we want to talk about, but then there's stuff you clearly don't want to spoil. There are surprises in store, so um, I'm going to hand you the uh, the get go. You get us started, and then we'll go from there. I, I get to start. Okay. Well, um, as you may remember, season one ends with. Uh, Shadow Moon discovering who Mr. Wednesday is. Oh, Ian McShane uh, sends his apologies. He wishes he could be here, but as he explained to me uh, in a text, they're just <laughs> zapping kidney stones, which he will then be pissing at. <laughs> that is the Ian McShane. I love Ian. Uh, so. He also asked uh, me to just say cocksucker. If that helps. There's only one Ian McShane. Um, so, um, Shadow Moon has discovered uh, exactly who he is working for. And now, season two is going to begin just a few short hours later and everything is going to get both better and worse. <laughs> um, the first place we are all headed is the House on the Rock. <laughs> and uh, we actually, they, they closed down the real House on the Rock for us for several days and let us film there. And uh, Ricky, and I'm not going to tell you which of the other people I'm up here with, um, but at least two of the other people I'm up here with actually got to ride on the largest carousel in the world, which they never let you ride on. <laughs> and not many people in the world have ridden a carousel, so I felt very privileged and honored. Yep. Basically, you're not allowed to, and they let us. <laughs> Some of the people up here. Um, and in, if, if you're familiar with the book, I think, I, think, I, think, I think the most useful piece of information I can give you, which is completely honest, is that we do not get to Lakeside in this season. However, we do get to Cairo, we do get to a funeral home. Um, Laura and um, Mad Sweeney get to go on their own journey, which is... Uh, <laughs> takes them to some really hot and exotic places, and um... It's just Whole Foods. <laughs> and other than that, um, I think it's fair to say things get worse for everybody. In dramatically interesting ways, obviously. <laughs> um, I have a question right off the bat for Emily and, and Rick. Uh, you. You know, when, when you're acting in things, you have to kind of draw on sense memory and your own experiences, but you're playing a couple that is not only dealing with the pain of infidelity, but also after the infidelity... Oh, she's pretty cool with it, apparently. Well, yeah, that she's, well, she's way too cool with it because that's been put in perspective of the fact that you died and have been resurrected. So, is how what memories are you pulling from to deal with a marriage that's trying to rebuild itself after infidelity and then resurrection? I don't know if, that's, if you've ever experienced anything like that in a relationship. Like, how do you draw on that? I think maybe Ricky has. I mean, I'm so much. Also, till death do us part. Huh? The, the, the thing was before she died. You need to stop. Ricky. I will never let it go. <laughs> in three years. <laughs> Ricky, this I turned down Big Timmy, Little was... Tiny. Are you done? <laughs> Shower <was> frightening. <laughs> Ricky likes to, in interviews, refer to me 
as Laura, but calling me Emily, so he, he talks to me as though I'm the person who died giving his best friend a wardrobe. Like, me. Still hurts. <laughs> it's troubling because the character is kind of an awful person. And, it's, you know, I'm gonna, and you're just chill. not. <laughs> No, she's not. She's wonderful. She's incredible. That's how great an actress right. she is. She's awesome. Um, but no, it is it is crazy. But you, you always make something relatable, and I think um, everyone can relate to loss. Um, God forbid it's something something tragic like 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 a loved one like that. But you know, you you lost your favorite button. You 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 know you. What? you <laughs> I'm trying to bring it down and make it relatable to everyone. Can you just let me finish? We're really married. <laughs> Um, so everyone can relate to a loss, and so you kind of just substitute different things for, for that. Um, so it's, for myself, um, I've had more than one girlfriend, so I know it's like to break up with a girl. Just the one. Um, it's, a little, it's a little bit of a brag, but we'll let that pass. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you just kind of play up on those, those kind of substitutions, and, and just multiply by a billion. <laughs> now, um, I'm going to ask you guys this, and then I'll open up for the rest of the cast. How far ahead are you given scripts to read to, for a sense of, like, did they send you an overall Bible for the whole second season as to where it was going to go, or was it script by script, you reading it and figuring out the journey that your character would be on? I was ad libbing. What about you? <laughs> um, everything's different. Um, you know, uh, before you get to set, you know, you, some, you tend to have a, a, couple of, a couple of scripts. Um, sometimes it can be weeks in advance. You know, sometimes you'll get amendments, you know, the day of, the morning of, on set. You know, it's, it's like any kind of project I've been a part of. Um, it's, a, it's a collaboration. Sometimes you have, you're able to kind of change lines here on the day and things. Sometimes you think you find different things or different moments or someone will play something you're like, oh, that's interesting. What if I did this instead? Oh, okay. And it's kind of, it's, it's literally like where this epic monster of a TV show becomes a play and we can kind of work and, and, and it becomes very fluid. So I'm very fortunate that I get to play with this incredibly talented cast that uh, I do. One of, one of the things that I would say is that and then, I mean, you do hand things over to the cast, is that one of the things that really um, was inspiring from where I was on this, which was mostly across an ocean in a cutting room of a completely different series, um, was how much all of the cast um, were invested in their characters, understood their characters, um, this season's writers were a whole new set of writers, and the cast made sure that the integrity of their characters was never compromised. And that, I think, is, says a lot for both um, the series itself and also for the fact that we have world-class actors who love and understand what they're playing and are not prepared to compromise and that for me has been huge all the way down the line. Yeah, all the, the, uh, the, the characterizations and the personalities are so vivid and especially it's amazing that they're all so vivid where so many of you are playing either otherworldly beings or beings that are maybe not that connected with humanity, you're drawn into their story. Some of you are literally playing ideas. So where do you find the, you know, humanity in, in, in support? Or what is your connective, the, the, the connective thread for you to that character? Chris, Ben, I'm looking at you. <laughs> well, uh, it, yeah, it's true there, there, there's conceptual uh, aspects, but then you, you, you've always got something you need so that becomes immediately relatable as a person. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. It's, uh, <laughs> no, it does. I, I, I never thought about it that way. Even if you're a god, there's something that you're like, oh, I still need yeah. this thing. It would, be, yeah. it would not be interesting if you didn't need something. Yes, that is true. And, and how you attain it becomes interesting. And then how, um, is, uh, a lot of the, uh, just based on season one, a lot of you did um, scenes where it was very, very heavy, special effects and very heavy visual effects that you had to sort of either act around or augment with your performance. How did you 
what do you, you guys remember uh, like a moment that was particularly difficult or that you, that was maybe hard to pull off effects wise? No, no, that was. What are you talking about? No. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all don't do that on a Friday afternoon? <laughs> no, I, I think it, it all goes back to um, this incredible work that has been created by this master storyteller, Neil Gaiman. Going back to that question you asked about um, what's it like playing, you know, gods, um, <laughs> Neil's work is so evocative, and I remember uh, one of the things that hit me was that these gods are distillations of human belief, human thought, in all uh, their extremities. And so, in as much as there are these otherworldly beings, these gods are absolutely human in their needs and their wants. And so when it comes down to playing uh, something that has maybe a lot of visual effects, maybe, <laughs> a couple, <laughs> um, then it didn't become about those things. Uh, I know there's probably quite a few VFX people right now that are like, Rui, you did it? <laughs> it was that. But we got to so deeply go into these stories that even though we were sitting there uh, with a trap door bed and becoming how many feet higher or, or, or taller, um, it really came down to what was going on between these two individuals. But when it comes to a master class in green screen acting, I always think of Ricky Whittle and uh, yeah. Buffalo acting. Yeah. <laughs> Would you care I know what you're pushing at. I know what you're pushing at. So this is my first, thanks to Neil and, and American Gods, my first experience ever of green screen. I'm about to give you, a, this is what we do, all right. You have to just drop everything and just hand it over to the director to hope he doesn't make you look stupid. <laughs> so this was me during the buffalo scene in the dream sequence. The director's telling you what you can see because it's just you a little mat and then green all around you, or blue, depending. You're coming through the cave. There's a tree ahead of you. No, it's bigger than that. Why? Really why? You're in awe. There's a buffalo behind the tree. It's coming towards you. It's bigger than that, that's not his face. <laughs> Steps towards you. You're scared. But intrigued. <laughs> it says believe. And then he goes, cut. And then you're just like, please make that look good. <laughs> It's really fun, and you just let go. The, the more you can let go and just go with it, the better it's gonna be. And that's where the true inner child comes out, and I like to really play as an actor, which is fortunate, because a lot of shadow stuff is green screen. Can I, ju can I just say? <laughs> as, 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 as hard as Ricky's buffalo acting is, <laughs> trained English actor, <laughs> It wasn't as hard as having to... Having to what? <laughs> no, really, it was what? To, to get boiled up. <laughs> day after day. In charcoal and baby oil. <laughs> and, then, and then be asked to make sweet love. <laughs> to this man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's not like a 
was just gonna say, I had to lift him a lot. I mean, you guys try throwing him around for hours upon hours. I mean, it's fun. <laughs> Can we just say how jacked Omid is this season? Um, like Salim hit the gym. Yeah. Here's the thing about Musa, he likes to he likes to deny the fact that uh, we use CGI in our scene. <laughs> <laughs> Guessing, but Pablo knows the truth. <laughs> uh, you guys look at Pablo. And he knows. <laughs> Green screen. Where do we go from there? <laughs> to the truth. <laughs> now, um, Pablo, you were. On, how, what was the transition between doing a show like Orange is a New Black and then coming to this show? Woo! How close were those two? Was that, was that a, a, a radical shift for you acting-wise, or...? Uh, no, they weren't very close together. Oh. Uh, <laughs> conceptually, <laughs> or chronologically. Uh, it had been a year and a half at least uh, since I had done any work on, on Orange is a New Black. Um, it had been a while, you know, it, it, my career has been an interesting thing that started early on with The Wire and that, that, that was like the first pop thing and then, and then I had a really, really quiet period for like a bunch of years <laughs> and then Orange is New Black happened and nobody knew it was coming and nobody saw it and so that was very interesting and strange and then it, I had about a year and a half of doing other things and then this character presented itself and and it was another opportunity, I felt like, to do something really physically, radically different, which I had such fun creating something so different for Orange is the New Black in terms of a look. Um, this seemed like it presented a really good opportunity for another physical transformation, but at the same time, um, something that was based in, in really good, solid character work, and the people involved, obviously, were incredibly interesting to me, starting with the creative team of Michael and Brian Fuller, who we had first season. Um, and, uh, and, and Neil, obviously, who wrote the source material that I was so incredibly, uh, I didn't know, I, I've told him this before, so I'm not, uh, I'm, not <laughs> I'm not spoiling anything here, but I didn't know of Neil's work other than Coraline, because I had read the kids' books, until I was presented with this series. And it opened up this world for me, uh, of his world, that has been one of the great gifts of my acting career, to get to, to discover his work because of, uh, because of this. And so when I read the book, I was like, immediately, uh, I'm in, I'm sold. Um, because, you know, he's only in two scenes in the book, so it shouldn't take me long to shoot. <laughs> and I was like, this would be a quick one. Yeah. And now I what are we three or four years here? It is, yeah. <laughs> Two seasons, four years. We are never going to let <laughs> you go. <laughs> And that, that monologue has, uh, it's, amazing, it's an amazing monologue that has become horrifyingly timely uh, as events have unfolded in the real world. Did you get a sense that, like, that, that it would land as, as hard as it did? Because I remember watching that scene, I rewound it and watched it like two or three times, I could, it was like, they're, they're literally calling out exactly kind of where this dark path the country seems to be going down right now. I mean, how did you feel when you first read it and then performed it? I mean, I, you know, when you read something like that, you, your first thought is, there's no way in hell they're gonna let me do this. This is never gonna happen. <laughs> so what will come to their senses and go, he can't say that like that. That's not, turn that off. That's not right. Send him back to reprogramming. Something's wrong with him. Um, 
really grateful for the opportunity to do it, to be honest with you. Um, you know, at the time that we were shooting it, it was like really hot in Toronto, and uh, the Toronto division of Black Lives Matter was marching at the time in the street, and they were talking about, you know, protesting and looking at human rights from the Canadian perspective, which obviously is generally not talked about. And so, I don't think I realized at all that it would be that prophetic. In many ways, I kind of felt like the difficulty of it is that we've all heard it before, and um, we've not done anything about it. Um, and I feel like that's kind of where we are now, right? We find ourselves in a situation where there's a tremendous amount of frustration around what's happening, particularly with women, but disenfranchised groups across the board, and it's impossible to do a show like this and not see how Neil's work 17 years ago so perfectly becomes a corollary for the world that we're looking at now. So when we say visionary, I think we, we don't say so trying to be cute, right? And I think that's the power of why we love these characters, all of us, it's what we fight for every day. And I think in many ways you're gonna see those things come to life for Mr. Nancy this way, this year, differently. Because a lot of the battle this year is really about what human slavery is today. And today, that's mass incarceration and human trafficking. So it's really yeah. you know, so exciting. exciting to be on a show that looks at uh, Muslims and sexuality and explodes even silly stereotypes like the big, the big leprechaun and you know what I mean. But, yeah, but the, jacked right, right. the jacked leprechaun. The jacked leprechaun. Hulk leprechaun. You know, getting his ass kicked by a female protagonist that he's not involved in a relationship with. I mean, these are the tropes that you know Neil was able to lay out in the book. These are the tropes that we fight, and it's why we do the show. It's why we love it, and why we're so grateful for you guys to show up here to hear more about season two. That's all I got, so thank you. Now, um, Bruce, you're sort of playing the more modern aspects of, I don't even know if it's like you would call it godlike. It's almost like you're, it's a god being born and getting reformed. Like, how, uh, how, do, you, how do you conceive of that? character and kind of bring it to life when he's, you're playing a constantly shifting character in a lot of ways. Sure. Um, so one of the ways that I approached the character was by thinking of him as a composite consciousness, um, by which I mean part of his consciousness is an artificial intelligence that has access to all the information on the internet and literally processes, inform uh, processes information faster than anything else around, almost, right? Um, another part of it was a deity that has only known worship, so it's just constantly getting this constant adulation, has never known anything in a negative context other than his personal relationships. Um, part of it was a, just a standard, very, very vulnerable, and this is the access point through the, through the meat space that he has to exist in a very, very human soul that has to interact and wants things in a very, very vulnerable way and has to interact in this incredibly vulnerable way. Well, I know uh, where my missing speed went there. <laughs> One of, one of the lonely things that we get to see a little hint of in season two is uh, the different incarnations of the technical boy. Because people, people grumbled to me in season one that the technical boy of the TV show wasn't the technical boy of the book. And I would go, yeah, but the technical boy of 1999, when I was writing the book, is not the technical boy of now. He would be cooler and so on. And just taking that idea, we started playing with it. And one of the things that I love is in episode six, uh, which is mostly set in the 1930s, uh, we get to meet the telephone boy. Um, who I think at that point has recently taken over from the telegraph boy. And, uh, and Bruce gets to be all of these things. And uh, of course, with any luck, we may even find out where he's going next. It would be cool if you showed the technical boy from the early 90s and he's constantly buffering and having to read the book. And you gotta wait forever for him to say one sentence and like, Jesus, like that would be... No? All right. He's at, I'm sorry, he's at modem speed right now. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, it is about time to start uh, opening up the floor to some of you guys' questions. Wow! 
They're ready. <laughs> yeah, which, uh, so, uh, right here with the awesome blue hair. Hi. Hi, I'm an aspiring director, so my question's actually for the cast. I feel like directing is something that only actors really get to see directors do. So my question is, how good does Ricky look today? <laughs> <laughs> Well, for me, I, I can't talk about director without talking about our producer-director, Chris Byrne. Um, for me, he's the, one of the huge reasons we've kept the continuity of season one in tone, look, the richness and how things are shot. The mind of that man is incredible. Um, and when he asks you to do stuff, there's a lot of directors that be like, <laughs> what? Um, because he, he, he'll, go, he'll, get like a, he'll get a bottle and go, so what I'm going to do is, I've got this bottle of water, I'm going to shoot some light through it, I'm going to shoot the camera over through here, so it's going to project up on your face, and I'm going to get you to come up through the light. And you're like, what? <laughs> but then you see it on screen, and it is magical. Um, and he works with an incredible crew that we've got up in Toronto. So the advice is, I think, if you want to be a good director, be magical. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I'm actually, talking about a moment. She asked about a, wins a, a beautiful moment. And for me, Chris Barn has given me those moments. He's a fantastic director. How does, what you just described, how does the director put you guys at ease when they are maybe shooting something that is going to be a little more esoteric and let you know that, well, but it will look like this. Here's like, how do they guide you through some of those moments? Maybe? I think that's definitely, that's definitely what Chris, Chris Byrne brought for us. Because he was with us for all of season one. He was the second unit director in season one. Um, and I think he knows the look of the show better than anyone. I mean, he's created all of the, all of the visuals for the show. Um, but I think by this season, we all felt so comfortable in our characters that, and so comfortable with Chris that we kind of just automatically trusted him. I think it was a little different first season as we were, you know, figuring out who these people were and it felt like a lot more collaborative then. And I think that we, I don't know, the, the directors in the first season definitely for me, like helped me figure out who Laura was in the show. So I don't think that helps at all. Directing an episodic uh, television is a, is a really thankless job. It's, it's hard because as uh, in episodic television, the, the actors, and specifically the ones who are series regulars, really take on, take the series as their own, basically, because they all know their characters and they're there all the time. And as an episodic director, you come in, and you're coming in from whatever other show you've worked on, uh, and, and you really know nobody, and so, uh, so much of the job is like instantly making relationships, being friendly to people, and just like trying to fit in and learn what the tone of the show is. So, directing an episode of television is so much different than like directing a film where it's your vision and it's your thing, your thing to create. Uh, as a director in episodic TV, you really, you have to learn everybody, uh, figure out what the tone of the show is, and figure out how to put that across rather than like trying to put your own stamp on it. I was also just really excited by the fact that this season, the majority of our directors were women. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, can we go to this mic over here, or...? Yes? Thank you, question. Hello? Um, actually, just to follow on what that young lady started, I'd like to know if Patton, can I get a hug? <laughs> Right, sure, sure. <laughs> um, first of all, Neil, I just want to let you know, early in March, 
Shepard pretty much said you're his favorite contemporary author, so I thought you might be interested in knowing him. Um, mine too, but that's besides the point. Um, but I just want to know how much for both this and for Good Omens are you on set? How much of it you're in? I know because you're involved behind the stage, but are you on set and dealing with that a lot on both the shows? Um, with Good Omens, I was on set pretty much all the time and there in post production pretty much all the time, which, due to my inability to master the intricacies of bilocation, um, meant that I wasn't in Toronto all the time. Um, I got up to Toronto before we shot and was there and, and got to um, work stuff out. I got to head out to Wisconsin um, to the House on the Rock shoot because I was damned if that was happening <laughs> without me. Um, and I got up to uh, Toronto while they were shooting episodes 204, 205. Um, which was also good because then I got to spend time with the writers of 206 and 207 in particular and um, really get deep into stuff like, you know, here is 6,000 years of Mad Sweeney's story, use as much of it as you want and that kind of thing. Um, for, you know, one of the things that I'm looking forward to a lot in future seasons is that I won't be full-time on set on Good Omens anymore. That is, that is finite and that is done. And uh, hopefully we'll get to spend a lot more time uh, with this bunch of reprobates. <laughs> Adaptability and uh, evolving, and in saying that, I believe my my preference would be for the old gods, not simply because I play one of the eldest gods, uh, but because uh, there's a reason why uh, they were not only established, but why they continue to endure. Yeah. Because the new guys are just the new guys on the scene, you know. But we really know how it's done. <laughs> He's dead. Tom is dead. You're clapping for death. <laughs> oh, um, without a doubt, you better answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, because it's becoming a very one-sided competition, I guess I'll, I'll throw in there that. Uh, well, uh, spiritually, I would, I would connect with the old gods. Uh, I think attention must be paid to the new gods. Uh, you can't, uh, we can't evolve as a society. We can't change things, and we can't look to make the world better if we don't acknowledge the things that we're battling against. So in the battle of the old gods and the new gods, we have to know what, uh, what it is that the society is, is um, uh, battling with. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what the fuck you just said. <laughs> uh, I'm probably gonna go old god personality wise, but you know, I guess totally. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. 
Are you a god? Yeah. Old <laughs> yeah. gods. Old gods. I think maybe I can't help but look at it through the lens of my character, but like Laura probably would, I'm not fucking siding with anyone. I'm out for myself. <laughs> they all seem crazy to me. I think it's less to do with personality and more to do with the osmosis of information in a sociological context. <laughs> structure changes in terms of metaphor and so there, the way people uh, interpret stories becomes new but the concepts can be old so I don't know that it's just it's amorphous so I but I I wouldn't really be thinking of them as gods I'd be thinking of them as a metaphor for some kind of internal truth that can change regarding what the culture is dealing with at the time. Yeah, maybe that, that's really interesting. It's the illusion that the gods are changing, but all that's changing is the interpretation. It's always the same base idea. I mean, can I say that again? Like you're saying the gods themselves don't change, <clears throat> it's how they're interpreted. Well, just in the story structure is amorphous. It, 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 and, and Gods are attributed to a certain internal thought or a, a early story structure, it would seem, that was more of the transition from one generation to the next, so that uh, imperative ideas were saved so people could live. So, so that means that these kind of uh, metaphors were easy nuggets to get down from one generation to the next. So, so there were these important ideas that were being passed down or orally, and then uh, they can, well, the, the standard telephone game where somebody talks, if I said one thing, by the time we got down to the end, the, the, the row up, I whispered into Bruce's ear and he whispered, etc. We have a completely different story at the end. Although I do think there are certain stories that probably have lasted for maybe millions of years. Who knows how long human beings have been actually speaking and passing stories down? Now I know what dinner at Crispin Glover's house is like. <laughs> <laughs> we can come over and hang out with you, sir. That, that would be that would be a great direction for like season three. That's a really cool idea. I like I love that. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm Jania, I'm a writer for Geeks of Color, and um, so one of the things that I really like about American Gods, the book and the TV show, is that when you're showing these gods, they're not just like the classic, like, 
white gods like the Creek and the you know Romans and the Norse. We're showing like a Nancy that I didn't know about until I watched the show. Um, so I just want to know like what what is that like being able to represent um, on such an important show? Like you're showcasing essentially the gods of other cultures. And so like what is that like for some of you guys who are not playing the ones? I guess all of you, um, the ones who are not playing, the ones that we're familiar with, what is that like to be able to represent different cultures through the characters that you're playing and introducing an audience to gods and folklore that they may not be familiar with? I was just going to say, as a, as, as a, as a non-god, as just an ex-con, <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's a great gift to be a part of this, this show and with Neil's, Neil's writing in this show, I myself, hopefully like our audience through around the world, I'm just being educated. Today, uh, we, we, season two, we welcome Sam Crow, who uh, is a First Nation lesbian. The actress is a First Nation lesbian, and she has been able to teach me so much more about her culture, and I've learned so much in season one, and now in season two, about all these beautiful cultures that I had no idea about, like yourself and Nancy. Um, and it's a great gift that we can that we could all learn, especially in this, the current times where it's you know diversity is beautiful. We don't all want to be the same thing. We want to learn about all the different flavors and colors in the world. Um, it's what makes this world beautiful. It's what made you know what it was making America beautiful is that everyone was kind of working together and just appreciating everyone's backgrounds and where they came from. We all have the same struggle it's to get to our beds at the end of the day with the one we love. You know, so as long as we can maintain that, it's great, but um, I'm really proud to be a part of the show, although I'm not a god, I love learning about every single one of these. I know about leprechauns because I used to live in Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like for you, Orlando? I was always good, uh, yeah, um, yeah uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> to answer your question, yeah, I think it's an important thing, right? Um, when you talk about representation, you know, and you particularly look at women, women don't often even speak on camera, right? So to have someone who's speaking and playing someone uh, who has their own agency becomes incredibly important. Uh, Anansi was somebody that my great grandmother and grandmother used to read to me about. Um, so he's been a part of my family forever. I, I wanted to play this role. I, I begged Neil Gaiman on Twitter. Um, <laughs> it's true. That is, that is how you got cast. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely true. Um, to play the role was important because the representation of that character was important and because of the journey of people of color to America, we are scattered all around the Caribbean, and so I wanted him to have all of those colors and flavors that Neil embodied in the character originally as part of why I loved the book so much. So um, I think critically important for me as a performer because that's not something I can do in most other roles I've had in my career. It's not a place I can go to. Right? So for me, as an artist, it opened up a lot of things that I wanted to try and play with that I didn't have access to. And in, in hoping and believing that it would touch you and other people wouldn't see the color of it all, but would see the pain, see the joy, see the struggle, and become a part of that journey with us, right? So I think that's why Stars makes the show. I think that's why we all love the show. That's why Neil wrote the book. So, you know, in a nutshell, I think it's so much bigger than representation. I think it's really about um, all of us, right? It's not us versus them, it's us and what we can do together. That's the power. Yeah. 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 I have a question as well because it makes me remember when I was growing up watching television uh, or if I was watching sports or entertainment. Uh, your question reminds me that when I watched, I was often looking for uh, someone who I felt uh, <clears throat> was my voice or represented my voice and and i think that transcends color you know i think it was uh, there was something within me and I, I would say probably something within all of you that are looking for that so in, in in terms of your question i think the opportunity to play as a person of color to play a a god a historical god of color um there's something that's very exciting to be on this end to uh, take on a role of being a voice for others who otherwise are looking for a voice in a way that I once was. Right, and the stories that we tell ourselves impact the way that we see ourselves. And so I think it's incredibly important, especially now, that as women, as people of color, we're able to see ourselves as powerful beings, the powerful beings that we are.
But Mr. Eamon, I just wanted to ask, um, you know, you talk about so many different mythologies and so many different gods, and obviously you had put some thought and research into it, and I just want to know, you know, how, how, what was your process of, of looking into it, of, of sort of figuring out all the details, not only that were true, but also that you wanted to put in your book, and then later the TV show? And well, for, for American Gods, um, I was lucky because without knowing it, i had been researching American Gods my entire life by compulsively reading all of the mythology, um, all of that stuff that I could possibly find. And um, so when I came to write it, there wasn't actually an awful lot of research. What there was, was I knew this stuff. This was the stuff I'd been living and breathing. These were the stories I wanted to tell. Um, what I love is what these guys have brought to what I did, because it takes something that for me was small and personal, an obsession with mythology, with world religions, um, with all of that stuff, and it brings it out to this huge, wide, uh, international audience. Uh, the, the fact that America Gods, the TV series, the first season just went so huge all around the world um, was such an unexpected and, and glorious delight. And I love that there are people all around the world now who, who know who Anansi is, who know who Gokbis is, who are uh, trying to figure out what the technical boy just said. <laughs> <laughs> that, for me, was the most important part. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Great Comic-Con, everybody.